my name is Tarek Masood. I'm the director of the Middle East Initiative here at uh, the Harvard Kennedy School. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to uh, this afternoon's talk by Professor Javad Salhi Isfahani on the impact of COVID-19 on Iran's political economy. And so uh, Javad is somebody who I've known ever since I came here uh, to Harvard, and he's somebody I have uh, long considered a friend uh, and a teacher. Um, he uh, is a professor, as everyone uh, knows, at the Virginia Tech University, uh, one of our most gifted economists, not just of Iran, but really of uh, the entire uh, Middle East. He grew up in Iran uh, and then did his undergraduate study in economics at the University of London. And then he came here to Harvard to do his doctorate in economics. Um, he then spent several years at uh, the University of Pennsylvania before uh, uh, taking up at uh, the Virginia Tech. Um, he has uh, many times, uh, several times, been uh, a fellow, uh, visiting scholar, senior fellow at uh, Harvard, and it's one of my uh, aims in life to try to uh, yoke his fate to my own permanently. So um, um, he uh, serves on a variety of boards, including the Board of Trustees of the Economic Research Forum, uh, which is a very innovative network of economists uh, who study uh, the Middle East. It's really been one of the main vehicles for bringing the modern study of economics to um, uh, the Arab world, and he's one of the uh, champions uh, of that. Um, uh, it's just, I don't have enough uh, good things to say about Javad and his intellect and his scholarship. Uh, those of you who have been following uh, the discussions about COVID-19 recently have seen his very influential and widely read recent article on COVID-19 in Iran that was published in Foreign Affairs. And so we're very thrilled to have him here to talk about uh, that you. work and uh, to move us forward uh, to think about the future. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to uh, my dear colleague, uh, Professor Javad Salahi Isfahani. Thank you, Javad. Oh, thank you very much, Tariq. That was a very generous introduction. And now I have a daunting task of living even partially up to it. Uh, so let me get started. I'm going to share my slides. Uh, and it should be okay. You see the slides now? Okay, so what I'm trying to do here is to explain this uh, triple jeopardy of uh, sanctions, the epidemic, and a most recent oil price collapse and see how Iranians are coping with these uh, difficulties. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, COVID-19, but the chronology is that Iran has been under severe sanctions since 2011 and COVID-19 crisis since mid-February and collapse of oil prices since mid-March. Uh, everyone knows that Iran's case is very special because of geopolitics. Uh, the question uh, has been asked by former diplomats, by world leaders, by op-ed writers, newspapers, is it time to ease sanctions against Iran or tighten them? And I just want to let you know that what I'm presenting is kind of colored by this debate. And my own view is that uh, sanctions have failed to achieve their goals and are therefore needlessly punishing ordinary Iranians at their most desperate hour. So uh, be aware of my biases, but I do think numbers have something to tell. Oh, yeah. And I've tried to convince you that uh, the data are worth looking at. Uh, so first I begin with the COVID-19 crisis. How bad is it really? Uh, you may have heard a lot that things are very bad in Iran and you shouldn't trust the numbers and all that. There are bad things that have happened. For example, <coughs> that authorities reacted too slowly uh, to the crisis. Uh, they waited until uh, the parliamentary elections were over on February 21 before they announced the death. So the health crisis is serious, but Iranians see 
uh, performance as acceptable. And this is the purpose of showing uh, a couple of graphs of the data that they collect and they report daily to uh, WHO. Uh, clearly, these data, as in the case of all countries, underestimate the gravity of the situation. But I'm going to argue that the trends are harder to fudge and therefore are quite uh, useful to look at. Uh, so here's the uh, graphs from the data that I have downloaded from the European CDC. And I've used them in my blog, javadsali.com, with some explanations if you're interested in that. On the left is the number of cases uh, that, uh, oops, the number of cases, daily cases, uh, divided by millions of people. Uh, and on the right is the number of deaths per million. And what you see here is two things. First, that Iran's uh, case appears to have peaked uh, around uh, early April and has steadily fallen. And for the first time, uh, the number of deaths, deaths, uh, daily deaths have declined, uh, have fallen below 100, which is about roughly half of their peak of 150. Uh, you have to remember that Iran, in Iran experiences 1,200 deaths norm, on normal times. So just to keep order of magnitude, uh, it's good to have that number. The second thing to notice is that Iran's case appears here much less serious than that of Spain, uh, which is not telling you a whole lot because we don't know. Maybe uh, Iran underestimates much more than uh, Spain does. Again, the most important uh, part of the story that these graphs tell is that the number is declining. I also want to remind you that uh, Iranians would be wary of uh, total underestimates of these data because uh, there are two checks on their claims. One will come when people turn in the registration, the birth certificates of the dead people to the relevant ministry. And the second will be a national census that will be taken next year. And death rates are death rates that are more than four or five percent of uh, increase uh, show in those kind of data. So claims that Iranians uh, underestimate by a factor of 10, I've seen that. Uh, the, even Iranians uh, Parliament's research center has made projections using uh, uh, simulation models to that order. Those would easily show because they double the death rate. And it would be impossible not to see that in the uh, census data. And I'm looking at now from the point of view of the health professionals, uh, whether they wanna take the risk of uh, losing their credibility by giving numbers that in a year or so would look like total lies. I kind of doubt, doubt that personally, but I leave it up to you what you want to uh, believe. If you look at the number of deaths uh, uh, per infected person, you see a similar picture, except here that the Spain, Spain is uh, uh, dropping faster than Iran. However, I am uh, fairly certain that with the new uh, return to work order, President Rouhani has asked about two thirds of the civil service to go back to work. Businesses are allowed, uh, were allowed to open as of Saturday. So uh, shopping malls are opening with some guidelines. Uh, public transportation is working. So I suspect Iran's numbers are gonna turn back up again. And there's gonna be this tug of war between health crisis and economic crisis. And I'll try to explain a little bit later uh, this trade-off, this tension between the two and how uh, Iran is facing that trade-off. So clearly, there is a link between the health crisis and sanctions. If Iran were not under sanctions, it would have probably done even better. Uh, 
the health crisis makes it very hard for Iranians to buy stuff on the international markets. And it's not so much about a ban of sale of specific goods to Iran, because Iran is allowed to import food and medical supplies. The problem is the way financial markets behave. Uh, most banks are very scared of large fines. Uh, you know, we've seen fines of nine billion, billions of dollars against European banks who have done dealings with Iran. And so at least they will slow things down. Uh, if a request comes to uh, move money around involving Iran, they would have to do what is known as due diligence. They have to make sure the money is not coming from a band uh, or an institution targeted by sanctions like the IRGC and the, uh, and the suppliers would have to make sure that the mask they sell doesn't go uh, to a hospital, for example, owned or operated by IRGC. That's a very tedious concern. The brave uh, companies will probably uh, take the risk and engage but they have been warned many times uh, by uh, Treasury, US Treasury, also by uh, groups like United Against Nuclear Iran who do independent threatening uh, of uh, suppliers in Europe not to engage and so on. Uh, and the situation is both difficult from the point of view of spending money that you do have and also not having any money to spend. And this is the reason why Iran has requested $5 billion from the IMF, something it hasn't done since the 1960s. It shows that the crisis now is much more severe than the one that Iran has experienced in the last few years, and many times having been described as having experienced economic collapse and things like that. So this is a very special time. And the Trump administration has come against uh, this $5 billion loans. And I'm going to show a bit later on that this $5 billion loan is uh, just about what Iran is likely to lose from the uh, lower oil prices, from the collapse of oil prices. So in order to make this budget still relevant, the budget that it started uh, on March 21st, uh, it needs to have at least $5 billion so even the optimistic budget that it, uh, it has proposed and been approved, for that to work, it would need at least $5 billion. So one of the questions in this uh, very tense geopolitical atmosphere that Iran is dealing with is does Iran have money uh, to deal with the health crisis and therefore does not need the $5 billion IMF loan? Uh, the controversy and confusion in assessing Iran's ability to pay for medical supplies and social protection is astounding. Uh, there, was a, there was a claim by Secretary Pompeo that Iran, uh, at least the Ayatollah Khamenei, the Supreme Leader, had $95 billion worth of assets under his control, an estimate that was upped to $300 billion by uh, Foundation for Defense of Democracies. And the argument is that they have this money, so they don't need the $5 billion. But this is really a disingenuous argument because these assets, they were accumulated, by the way, uh, through revolutionary uh, seizure of assets uh, over the years, uh, are in land and stocks, uh, company stocks. So they cannot be turned easily into foreign exchange. Who would buy them and give them euros or dollars? even if they did get euros and dollars by selling these assets, then it would be just like the foreign exchange reserves that are currently frozen in foreign banks, which Iran cannot use to buy medical supplies or imp import other essential goods. So I think it's a, a strange argument to say Iran has and should be able to spend that money and then at the same time saying, we are going to uh, squeeze Iran until Pips squeak, which is a quote from uh, Mr. John Bolton. Now, on a positive note, I think, and this is something that I think 
corroborates uh, the health data, the COVID data that I just showed, Iran has a good health infrastructure. One of the first things the revolution government did in the 1980s was to build 18,000 health houses and integrate all rural families, register all of them into a health network visited by uh, health, uh, uh, by barefoot doctors, for example. And that was the basis for a rapid reduction in child mortality, maternal mortality, and followed by a fertility decline that overall improved health in rural areas uh, tremendously. Iran also has universal access to electricity and clean pipe water, 86% to pipe natural gas. These are all things that make life healthy and pleasant for ordinary people. Uh, and that is the reason why Iran has a high HDI rank despite its uh, low performance on the economic front. Its HDI rank is a bit above Mexico. It used to be above Turkey until a couple of years ago. Now it's just a, below it. Iran's life expectancy is 76 years, which compares well with 70 years, 80 years in the US. Uh, noting that Iran's per capita income is at least one third, if not one fourth of the US, depending on how you calculate it. There is national health insurance. Rural people have been insured since 2005. It was a plan that Rouhani brought to bring everyone national health insurance. It is underfunded, so people complain a lot. Obviously, in a poor country under sanctions, you cannot have a very generous national health insurance. But the fact is, everyone can go to a hospital and show a little piece of paper that says, I'm registered uh, with the national insurance and get, gain admission. And that's really important for people to feel that these public hospitals, which are the majority of hospitals in Iran, uh, are places they can go. Now, let me turn to sanctions. One of the points that I want to make very strongly is that despite what people have said many times that Iran's economy has collapsed or has been near collapse, that Iran has been going backward for decades, all that do not show up in data, data that are published by international organizations like the World Bank. Uh, the data I'm going to show you in the next slide show that Iran's economy was actually growing until 2011. It was growing at par with a better performing economy like Turkey's. Uh, and all this ended when Obama introduced the uh, sanctions, sanctions against financial uh, transfers to Iran in 2011. The economy has been stagnant since, but interestingly, employment has increased. And I think there's a kind of an interesting story here, which makes the sanction crisis very different from the COVID crisis. Sanctions had a, a, a silver lining, if you like, and that is weaning Iran from its addiction to oil. And you can see that by data on employment. And I trust the employment data a lot because they come from uh, surveys that were designed by ILO and they were done uh, throughout the year, uh, 115,000 households in a regular year, about 600,000 people are interviewed. It's very, very hard to fudge those data. And I work with that micro data at the unit record level for years. And if somebody was mixing things up, you would see it in one variable or another. Uh, last year, uh, and this is a very interesting point about how we perceive Iran. Last year, GDP in Iran grew by 1%. It's a very low rate. It's below the rate of population growth. So per capita income actually declined last year by about half a point to one point. But it is a far cry from a minus 9.5% predicted by the IMF for uh, 2019. And I think the divergence is because IMF plugs the stuff into a model that's probably not very sophisticated. Whereas in the real world, when you have a major devaluation, as I'm going to explain very soon, uh, resources move about. Um, 
very versatile private sector in Iran is looks at much higher prices for imported goods, sees people are not buying that and start producing those things. I don't have very firm data on this because this is fairly new stuff. This happened in the last couple of years, but uh, by looking at the data, we will see that uh, there is a potential for Iran to have been able to move up, move its economy forward, to restructure it uh, during sanctions, and not despite sanctions, because of sanctions. Because it's very hard to get a whole country get its act together and shed its addiction to oil. Now, the story is going to be very sad for this year. As I mentioned, COVID-19, sorry for the typo here, does not have a silver lining. There's a very serious supply shock. Uh, so prices can be right. You may want to produce something that cannot be imported anymore, but you can't find the workers because they're at home. That is a very different story than the story of sanctions. How long this will continue, the COVID crisis will continue, is anybody's guess. So at least for months to come, Iran is going to be on a kind of a uh, 10, 20% below normal production rate. So let me begin by uh, on the, uh, introducing Iran's economy by uh, looking at data that you may not ordinarily see. And these are data which are called purchasing parity, uh, par purchasing power parity data. You know, prices in Iran are very different than prices in the United States. What uh, a lot of people have been doing first at the University of Pennsylvania, then at the World Bank, is to compare uh, living standards using a uniform set of prices, using prices in the US to evaluate the amount of goods at a family's disposal in Iran, in Turkey, in 180 countries around the world. And if you look at these data, which I downloaded from the World Bank website, you see that Iran and Turkey, Turkey is red, Iran is brown here. Uh, from 1990 to 2010, they were kind of at par, up and down, but both countries were growing. Is a very clear departure that cannot be explained by uh, change in economic policy or change in uh, regime or anything like that. The only thing that fits the story is uh, the, oil, uh, the, the sanctions. Oil price collapse had something to do with it, which is probably why there's a little bit of uh, lower than it would be, but there is a sanctions story here. If you look at the 2016, there is a fairly sharp increase. It was 13% increase in GDP. That's a very special year. That is the one year after JCPOA when sanctions against Iran were eased. Not removed, but eased. And like a jack in the box, the economy sprang up. And looking at this graph and looking at the story I'm telling you, you see an economy that has a lot of people very active and very optimistic trying to get things done. This is not an economy that is depressed, that is permanently screwed up and cannot get its act together. And this is why I think the story of sanctions become very important. They are preventing Iranians from doing what they would normally do. Now, turning to the employment story, which I find much more interesting, you see the overall employment trend in, trend in red having been increasing since sanctions hit Iran since 2011. There is an up and down, which is because this data is seasonal. Uh, the black line in the middle is manufacturing. Now, manufacturing ordinarily, uh, when you have sanctions and you have to buy spare parts, doesn't do very well. And here, they have increased their employment. Why are firms hiring workers? By the way, we have seen the same thing happening in 2012, right after the Fed sanctions, but very little of that. There, for that period, we have much more detailed data at the firm level. But the reason why this didn't happen in 2012 is because Obama sanctions were very quickly followed by negotiations. If 
by 2012, there was talk that something was going to happen. And by 2013, when Rouhani was elected, there were actual negotiations. So if you were a company, you wouldn't see a different future. You would see return to the past. You would stick with your current production plans. This all changed with the 2018 announcement, which, by the way, was coming for months and months. Iran entered an economic crisis before Trump actually, in May 2018, reimposed sanctions. People, Iranians believed Trump before Rouhani did. A businessman did. And you can see that in the data. But then came a very clear message from Iran's supreme leader that we are done with the West. He said it repeatedly. We are going to go back to what he had described as a resistance economy. And I think that got business people to change their production plan. And as a result, we see uh, be between 2010 and 2019, for example, three more million people working. Half a million jobs have been created in industry, uh, in the economy since uh, Trump's sanctions. So all these are evidence that the economy is responsive to prices. It's also a, point, a positive point about Iran's economy. Unlike the countries in the other side of the Persian Gulf, they don't have an exchange rate pegged to the dollar. Their exchange rate is flexible. Then they allow it to actually devalue, unlike places like Venezuela. Uh, they haven't uh, devalued completely, so they keep some of the dollars for themselves that they sell at a lower rate. But there is a way a businessman can sell something, domestically make money, export it to Afghanistan or Iraq and make a lot of money because he or she is allowed to turn her dollars into reals at a favorable rate, either at the private market or at the market that is government run between buyers and sellers, importers and exporters. That is an important part of the resiliency of Iran's economy. It allows markets to work. In particular, it allows foreign exchange rate to uh, change prices throughout the economy. Relative price is a big story in Iran, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So there are two lines here, the blue line and the red line. The blue line is the nominal exchange rate, the free market exchange rate that you might read in newspapers. The red line is my calculation, correcting that for price changes in Iran relative to prices of its trading partners. It's called the real effective exchange rate. And what you see here is a very large decline throughout the 2000s uh, in uh, the exchange rate, meaning Iran's currency was becoming more expensive and dollar was becoming cheaper. Uh, this is not surprising because Iran had a, uh, experienced an oil boom at that time. And part of the time it had a populist president uh, who would like to throw money at people, though that is not visible in here. Uh, what happened is uh, after sanctions hit, this uh, bonanza ended, this party ended, and the Iranian currency went up. There was a big collapse of the currency in October 2012, and the real exchange rate has gone up. And then again, it starts going down. Iranians, especially the middle class, love a cheap, the cheap dollar. They travel with it, they send their kids abroad, they go for medical expenses, and they buy televisions and cars and so on. Uh, so there's a big lobby in Iran for having a cheap dollar, uh, except that now it's very difficult to maintain that. In 2018, when the Trump uh, sanction rumors started, again, the economy went on in, into a crisis, uh, and the, Real collapse this time even bigger than before. And you can see that as the rise of the uh, market, uh, uh, the uh, dollar exchange rate. Dollar became a lot more expensive. It trebled in a matter of weeks. Now, if you want to get into a little bit more economics, you might want to look at the price of tradables versus services, which are not tradable. And you can see here that anything that could be imported in the 2000s was becoming cheaper. And then it increased, this relative price reversed and imported goods, tradable goods became more expensive. And 
again, we see this after uh, the second collapse, which I associate with Trump's reimposition of sanctions. And that's the world we are living right now. Tradable goods have much higher prices than they did before relative to things like uh, education, real estate, hotels, restaurants, haircuts, and so on. And that's where I think jobs are being created. This is what I call the silver lining in uh, the uh, sanctions story. Uh, the credit, of course, doesn't go to Mr. Trump. It goes to Iranians who take advantage of a flexible market economy to do things for themselves. Uh, now, sanctions have limited restructuring. An economist looking at these relative prices would say, yeah, this economy is going to boom big time. Uh, you allow devaluation and production is unleashed. However, in the case of sanctions, that is not true because number one, Iranian producers use spare parts. This is the legacy of decades of globalization. Iran has had a very open economy, so you never wanted to produce everything domestically 100%. You always imported a part that was too expensive to make in Iran. Very rational. As a result, they're caught in a bind now to make everything important from cars to TVs uh, to washing machines. You need a part, maybe a chip that you need to import and you cannot. So what we see now is a very limited restructuring, restructuring uh, during sanctions. There's a lot of uh, incentive also to export naturally uh, foreigners are the ones who have dollars and dollars become expensive. So if you can sell something abroad in Dubai, uh, in Afghanistan or uh, Iraq, you're much better off. Here, COVID-19 has intervened. Borders were closed very shortly after Iran became identified as the second epicenter of the epidemic, of the global pandemic. Iraq uh, closes borders, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, and uh, Turkey. Now, those borders have reopened partly. And they're doing ingenious stuff like moving containers, but no, not moving trucks across border. They're probably going to institute uh, equipment there that will take a uh, container from back of a truck, move it across uh, the border without a person touching it, and then at the other end, they will disinfect it and the goods will be exported. All that means costly restructuring. Let me turn to the last crisis, the oil price collapse. Uh, when I first gave uh, this talk, I, I wrote this at below $30. Now I don't know what to write. Maybe somewhere between 10 and $20. A lot of Iranian oil was probably under some kind of contract, so it hasn't become like the Texas intermediate uh, crude, which is selling at negative prices. The, again, the good news here for Iran is that Iran is not that dependent on oil anymore. It has, for several years, been dealing with shortage of uh, foreign exchange. And its budget, the government budget, has become a lot less dependent on the oil income. Uh, this, this year, the projected revenue for oil is about $10 billion, and this was before uh, the price of oil collapsed to the current levels. And if you contrast that with uh, oil exports of $100 billion a decade ago, you know what kind of pressure the country is under. Uh, even compared to recent past, the share of oil in government revenues has come down from 30 to 17 percent in the last year or so. Uh, I suspect that oil income this year is going to be around five billion dollars a year. Five billion dollars. This is kind of the magic number equal to what Iran is requesting from IMF. I'm not sure that's uh, probably a coincidence because you can borrow, borrow $5 billion from the IMF under an emergency a quick loan, which has, hap which has not happened. But Iran needs that desperately because uh, of uh, the need to limit 
the interaction of people in the in production and pay them to stay at home. About three quarter of Iranians work in enterprises with fewer than five workers. All these enterprises lack access to the banks. A big employer can go to a bank, go to government saying, I don't want to fire these workers. They become trouble for you. Why don't I get a loan to pay them and hold them up? And that happens a lot in Iran. But if you are a mechanic with three guys working, three guys, you know, you can't go to a bank and ask money to pay your workers. The government should do that. This is what a lot of European countries are doing now. They are preventing uh, enterprises from disintegrating because putting them back together is not easy at all. Iranians had plans, the government had plans to pay these people and they have some loan programs that are conditional on not firing your workers, but to pay them with reals that are not backed by anything like foreign exchange would only create inflation and create more unhappiness. And if they can get the $5 billion loan from the IMF, they might be able to keep a lot of, I'm talking about tens of thousands of small enterprises, micro enterprises afloat for a few months while they work through this uh, back to work story. Now, how do they manage the social cost? Uh, clearly, when your economy is shrinking, you're going to have uh, sections of the population that drop below the poverty line. Now, Iran has had a very good record with uh, reducing poverty. If there's anything that the Islamic Republic is known for, it's a charity economy. It has large charity organizations, semi-private and public, government-owned, and it has also smaller private charities. And it also has, since 2011, a fairly well-run cash transfer program that is kind of unique in the world. Not many countries have 80 million people with bank accounts that instantaneously you can put money into. So, but the government is broke. That is the problem. It has a decent system to reach the poor, but it needs to have money to do that. Uh, if you look at the government budget, it has cut back its public investment. This is the part that makes the economy grow. This is the part that hires people. It's cut it back so much that it's now less than two thirds of what it was just three years ago. It now, to, in order to fix the big hole in the budget left by the drop in oil sales, it is planning to borrow three times as much as it did last year uh, from the public, from a public that's very unwilling to lend to the government. The public in Iran is very willing to lend to corporations. They buy stocks. Iran stock exchange has been the best performing in the world in the last year. They are willing to buy gold, but they're not willing to lend to their own government. That is not a big surprise if you know Iranians and how skeptical they are of getting their money back from the government. Uh, so, uh, what the government is doing now is paying cash to about four or five million uh, people, uh, up to six million reals, which is worth about uh, uh, about six hundred dollars, twelve hundred dollars, I would say. You know, uh, converting this in not the free market rate, which would be a mistake because these people are not going to spend this money in New York or Milan. They're gonna spend it in a small town in Iran where prices are much lower. That's why we do PPP, purchasing power parity. Uh, everybody, uh, almost everybody, 70 million people get monthly cash transfers, which are not negligible. There are 16% of median per capita household expenditures, about $50 in PPP is enough to stave off hunger, I believe. So one of the big challenges for the Iranian government is to balance health and economic and the economy uh, to have basically, uh, to put it more starkly, whether people should, uh, should risk dying from the coronavirus 
or die from being unemployed and being very poor. The government has gone back and forth, and there's a very active debate in Iran, if you read their press, about whether Iranians should go back to work or not. But right now, the decision is that they should go back to work, as I mentioned earlier, and this will probably cause a spike in the epidemic. Uh, my last point is uh, about the politics of uh, the epidemic and sanctions. And you may have heard a lot of people say that the epidemic in particular favors authoritarian rule. And there is good reason to believe that. Uh, I believe that sanctions also did a very similar thing. When a country is under threat, as a general rule, people look to their leaders for protection. And if the leaders are careful, they can read, uh, invent themselves uh, as the uh, protector of people. And that's, I think, something that the Islamic government has done relatively successfully. The conservatives, which favor authoritarian rule, now control the parliament. They have about 80% of the seats. They're in a good position to win the presidency in 15 months. Uh, and altogether, you can see even already that uh, complaints about democratic rule, rule of law, and so on are taking a back seat to demands for food, medicine, better run hospitals, cleaning the streets. The Revolutionary Guards have made a very strong appearance during the crisis, even though they don't have medical uh, knowledge of any sort. They, uh, they try very hard. They claim they've invented an incredible uh, system for detecting the virus, uh, the uh, video of which has gone viral. Uh, the parliament did not approve the budget. That was the first uh, effect of the uh, coronavirus. They quickly closed the parliament and sent the budget to Guardian Council who quickly approved it. And furthermore, to withdraw money from the National Development Fund uh, requires uh, approval of the parliament. Now, uh, what President Rouhani did was simply ask the Supreme Leader for permission. So that has changed the Supreme Leader's uh, position already. He is now taking a lot more control of the uh, uh, running of the country. Uh, I just want to end with this one last slide that Iran has a very large civil society. Until sanctions hit, 60% of the population were classified, could be classified as middle class by international standards. And there is a fairly large and active private sector. They don't control the commanding heights of the economy, but they are there. And they may be dormant for a while, but they shouldn't be written off. They're not gonna go anywhere. And if you look at the medical professionals who now appear at the forefront of this last uh, crisis, the COVID crisis, they are very much like the private sector work, uh, workers and entrepreneurs who were at the forefront, in my view, of the uh, sanctions crisis by replacing production where imports were lost. And I think they're going to come back, demand in some fashion, some say in how the country is run. That is a drama that we will be observing in the coming months and years. And I want to stop here and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Javad, for such a, a, a learned uh, talk. Um, I want to uh, uh, briefly abuse my position. If you could keep, keep your, maybe you might keep your slides up. I suspect people will ask you to sure. reference some of those slides. But I, I just wanted to get you to elaborate a little bit more on the last two slides that you ended on. So, you know, it sounded like you initially were saying that the politics of this seemed to be uh, favorable to the conservatives. And uh, that caused me to be a little bit puzzled because of uh, my, my sense that, and as you said in, in the following slide, Iran actually does have a, a, a civil society, a middle class, um, and the Iranian uh, government uh, has in some ways been seen to have mismanaged uh, 
the response to uh, COVID-19. Uh, I think the the example that you just gave of the uh, Revolutionary Guards claiming to have invented or discovered some new uh, gadget that will detect uh, this virus, that gadget, I think from what I saw, is very similar to the gadget that the Egyptian government claimed to have uh, discovered that could cure hepatitis C and AIDS, which is also similar to a gadget that a British con man was selling to the Iraqis to detect bombs. And I just think knowing what I know of Iran, a very uh, educated, highly intelligent society with, as you say, a large professional class, I just see I wonder if the, all of these things, the mismanagement of the crisis, et cetera, uh, might be fuel for uh, movements uh, to open up the political system. I am not sure it will. You know, these kinds of uh, back and forth, uh, one side or the other putting their uh, foot in their mouth has been going on for a while. And uh, I don't think that uh, one can say now whether running the economy and running the medical system under these very difficult circumstances is going to be ignored by people and then focus should, would go on the initial delay, uh, which no doubt cost a lot of lives, uh, or the faux pas of uh, appearing to be doing uh, technological advances that uh, uh, challenge the mind. On uh, a daily basis, I think people see uh, order. They see that when the government said, go back to your homes, people generally did. It, as I mentioned in my foreign affairs article at the beginning, the government didn't and they, people dr were driving around, which is, uh, explains the initial peak. And we should expect another peak. But on a daily basis, people see they can go buy stuff Prices are higher, naturally, but the stuff is there. They see uh, that the hospital doors are open to most people. Uh, you know, some hospitals overrun, obviously, but generally the system is working. And I doubt very much that under these circumstances, even if they think that uh, the authorities are not doing a good job, that they're going to take the additional step of protesting uh, things because there's a big gray area when you have such uh, crises, especially the COVID crisis, which has internationally uh, alerted people to Iran's uh, predicament and has made U.S. sanctions seem more cruel than usual. And under those circumstances, for, pe for people to turn and only blame their own government or the state, the larger state. Javad, do you, do you see at all any, so I, t I, I take your point about sort of uh, the demand side or public uh, opinion, but do you see uh, any serious differences emerging among the political elite in terms of the response to the crisis? Because that can often precipitate uh, broader social action if there's some deep disagreement and, and fight that's uh, happening at the top. Well, Iran's uh, political system is famous for being dual. Disagreement is part of the everyday life. The Minister of Health goes to the parliament and says, I knew there was a crisis before the election day. And I told all the cabinet members that this is a crisis. And they said, don't announce it. So uh, yeah, there is definitely uh, a divergence of opinion about what to do. There's a lot of criticism of the uh, uh, clergy who were hesitant to close uh, places of prayer, the mosques. Uh, so Iran is, does not have a unified voice. And uh, I think the fear is that if the situation continues, one side is likely to lose. I doubt the next minister of uh, health is going to be as brave as the one we have now, who happens to be uh, an expert in uh, the transmission of disease. Uh, so uh, you can go through a lot of areas of life, the economy in particular, and there's a lot of divergence of opinion. 
Rouhani and his team want Europe to remain as trading partner of Iran because they fear a kind of a hostage situation or captive situation with China. Uh, they don't trust Russia as a trading partner, even as a protector. So, uh, but then you see other people who say, we prefer working with China. And that the voices of those people have become a lot stronger in the last couple of years, that we should work with China. China has been great. It has done best in containing COVID. Russia has done great in containing uh, the epidemic and, and U.S. is the one that has done worse. So this debate between East and West is almost everywhere in Iranian politics at this time. And then sometimes it becomes very uh, special about whether or not they announce the arrival of the coronavirus on time or not. Thank you, Javad. So the, the idea here is that, yes, there's disagreement, but nothing like a split in the regime that might precipitate some kind of uh, instability. Um, okay, we have uh, several hands up, and so I'm just going to call on people in the order that I see them. If you please go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, Mr. Saleh, he went through a lot of charts and statistics. I'm not going to go through all of those, but I'm just going to mention the last one that he referred to. He referred to a loan that recently announced by Iranian government to Iranian people. The amount in Iranian money value was one million tomans, and in the beginning it was with high interest of more than ten percent. It was opposed to it was brought to something called Qarz al Hassaneh, which is, by the way, has a still four percent interest rate. Mr. Salehi came because people don't know what tomans is. He converted that one. He first started with six hundred, and then he said close to twelve hundred. But the fact is that one million two months in Iran is equivalent to about sixty dollars, not six hundred ten times more, not one thousand two hundred twenty times more. And as a uh, proof or uh, in su in support of his uh, exchange rate, he mentioned that the people in Iran they are going to use those things for their own things that they want to buy in Iran. He knows very well that all the appliances in Iran, if they are not more expensive than Western or in the US, they are at least as expensive as that. And even their ordinary food, like meat, rice, and so on, are about the same amount of, uh, amount of price. For example, a pound of uh, beef or fish is equivalent to whatever we can buy it here in the US. So in short, I would say that this is very dishonest to bring these statistics and bring it to the people who don't have any idea about those things and present it like this one to them. So okay. again, summarize it to the case that no, it's not 600, it is $60 over. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Saleh Isfahani, would you like to respond to that point? Yeah, I'll do quickly. You know, I don't invent these numbers. They are calculated by professionals at the World Bank. I'm sure you don't agree with them. They published something called the PPP exchange rate. And the last one was under uh, 2002 month. That was for 2018. And at the time, the free market was 13,000, I believe. So there's a big gap between these two exchange rates. And I go by science uh, because that's what I do. I'm an economist, and when other economists write, you know, Deaton, Angus Deaton won a Nobel Prize in economics two years ago. He has been overseeing this project at the World Bank. And uh, of course, I can go by what my uncle says in Iran too, uh, but I prefer to go with Angus Deaton. And I would remind you that if uh, you go by what I had, uh, you know, there have been different numbers thrown around there was a loan of two million two months that I believe I translated in my foreign affairs article to $1,200 and someone uh, wrote a very angry email saying exactly what you're saying. Now I reminded them that if you take 12, that loan to $120 uh, or actually $70, that's what I thought it becomes, uh, 
ask how many workers can you hire in Iran with that money uh, in, when you have the reals and how many workers you can hire in Europe and the US. And there you'll find your answer. You can hire and not more resources inside Iran, specifically unskilled workers whose wage is a very good indicator of the cost of living. Take an unskilled wage in the US, take an unskilled wage in Iran and divide them, see what number you get. Thank you, thank you for letting me. Um... Kidding. So, um, Professor Svahani, look like um, you know well what's going on inside the um, Iranian government. And uh, I don't actually. So, well, I mean, you, um, you explain it from the economic uh, point of view. Um, so, can you um, tell me about uh, Supreme Leader's hedge fund, which um, estimated to be over 200 billion and um, what you know about it why this money is not used to help Iranian people and uh, um, so basically what I heard from you the whole time it's regimes talking points and so I assume you know about their hedge fund and how those uh, charity organizations that are all connected to the supreme leaders, how it's being um, used to help Iranian people. Thank you for the questions. And so so I, I understand the question to be about uh, resources that the uh, regime may have that uh, are not uh, spent on the people. Can you comment on that? Yeah, sure. You know, the only number I have seen that has been seriously reported was $95 billion worth of assets of the Satat which is an organization that manages, is a big holding company, it's not a hedge fund really, is a holding company that manages all the resources that have been seized since the revolution. Now, if you look at the Reuters uh, report, uh, the actual estimate should be much lower. And I'll tell you why, because I know the previous speaker wanted me to use the free market exchange rate. But guess what uh, Reuters did when it summed up all the real values of the assets? It divided them by the official exchange rate because it would make the number look a lot bigger. If it had divided it by the free market exchange rate, it would have been less than a third of that. It would have been about 30 billion. So there's no doubt that there's that money there. These are companies actually that don't, don't even make money. Uh, if you try to sell them, you will not get $30 billion for them. Uh, I don't know where your $200 billion comes from or where the FDD's $300 billion comes from. People say things. But Reuters report probably did a good job of patching together various assets and trying to put dollar value on them. Uh, but in doing the dollar value, it made a choice, which is to divide it by a much smaller number called the official exchange rate, and you can see that in the report, in order to get the 95 billion, which had the big dramatic effect. Thank you, Professor. So my question isn't too different in the, its premise, but um, I was thinking about Iran's spending on its proxies and other, and its support for the Assad regime, even its, its um, the funding of IRGC. This theoretically should add up to tens of billions of dollars a year. And so wouldn't, wouldn't either the easing of sanctions or the support of the $5 billion IMF loan indirectly be subsidizing those activities? I don't know where you got numbers of tens of billions of dollars. Uh, I have not seen any numbers how much Iran spends in uh, Syria or uh, in Beirut or in Yemen. Uh, I'm sure those operations cost money. Uh, I don't know if the government would be risking running the economy down. I tried to explain the dilemma as not just a simple pay this or pay that. You have thousands of businesses that can go under. If you could maintain those workers for three months so that the business would resume activity and you were the leader of Iran and you had Hezbollah at the other end, 
you tell me which one you would want to give the money to. Uh, so I, you know, I don't really know what the Iranian government does or is going to go, is going to do. I'm not uh, in Iran. I don't look at their books. I'm just looking at whatever is publicly available. And I have not seen any numbers that uh, show tens of billions of dollars. Uh, Iran's military budget, the whole military budget is fairly small. It's much, much smaller than its neighboring countries. So uh, yeah, I, I would uh, personally, I would say uh, we have to go by international rules. Countries have the right uh, to request emergency loans from IMF. And we don't ask other countries what they're going to do, although there is going to be some monitoring. IMF does not give the money and just say, do whatever you want to do with it. And uh, we just have to go by that. We can't just single out one country saying, you are going to not spend it well, but everybody else is well behaved. Uh, look, at, if you want to see how Iranian government has been spending its money, just look at the data. Look at Nigeria, which is an oil exporting country, and look at Iran over the last 20, 30 years. You'd be amazed how much better Iran has done with its resources than Nigeria has done. My Iranian friends always get angry at me and say, are you comparing us with Nigeria? Yes, I do, because you can see economic performance. A government that squanders billions of tens of billions of dollars abroad can't keep an economy going at average of 5% growth over two decades. Thank you very much. Professor, my question is relating to foreign affairs. Do you think that Iran will take a softer line uh, toward its neighbors in order to deal with this crisis to get more supply or sell or with national currency? Because as we see that Iran is not doing very, I think it's not doing very well with regard to its neighbors uh, in the Middle East. So do you think that there will be a softening in line with regard to this uh, recent developments. Thank you. Thank you for your question. You know, it reminds me that I should have gotten one of the PhDs uh, that Tarek has in political science because I feel handicapped here. Uh, I can play around with numbers, but I can't really answer this kind of question. Uh, I beg forgiveness. I suspect the answer is yes, that when you are in a situation of what, what do they say, if you are uh, in a in a, in a chale, we say in Persian, I forget the word, stop digging. Anyway, you get my point. Right. So it's quite possible that there are voices uh, in Iran that say, we can't be hostile to everybody. We need to minimize the number of enemies we have. We can't have Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, angry at us. They have a decent relationship, I believe, with Kuwait and Qatar from the little I know. And I do hope personally that they will seize the opportunity uh, without loss, uh, loss of face to make amends. Uh, hello, uh, I have a simple question. I'm not very, uh, you know, uh, economic matter savvy, uh, just uh, as an Iranian American, uh, being forced to live in exile rather than serving my people after I came to U.S. to uh, go through my college. And uh, it has been a big sorrow uh, that I wasn't able to go back to my country because of my opposition to this system that has violated the human rights of all sector of Iranian uh, you know, nation. Uh, my question is, in, even in... Uh, uh, regime in the parliament, uh, they were debating and uh, beating each other up about $4.7 billion loss uh, in their budget. Nobody is accountable uh, to what happened to $4.7 billion. It's so interesting that $5, million, uh, $5 billion for IMF loan, if that money wasn't lost, it wouldn't have been needed. I'm all for $5 billion, even $50 billion help. Uh, of my poor and uh, people of my motherland who are in this destitute condition. So uh, how can that be explained uh, that uh, we give money to a regime, to a government who cannot be trusted what, even for with a dollar? 
uh, they have proven in the last 10 years uh, with based, based on documented information, they have spent more than uh, 10 to $15 billion every year helping Bashar, uh, Bashar Assad regime in Syria to kill innocent uh, women and uh, children in Syria. So uh, that's, that's my question. How can a corrupt regime to be trusted with even a $1 rather uh, if, even, you know, $5 billion? I don't know. I'll go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I think, uh, I don't know if there's any developing country that doesn't have corruption. And uh, I believe that uh, Iran has corruption uh, at a certain level on a big scale. And a lot of that is probably related to uh, sanctions, to having to do trade surreptitiously. Uh, you know, big, big scandals like the $3 billion money stolen by well, Pakistan Johnny was clearly related to the oil ministry falling into a trap of giving oil to a person who said has ways of selling it and bringing the money back and then didn't. And so you, you do uh, add to corruption uh, when you impose sanctions on a country because you're basically telling them to break all kinds of rules, their own rules, other people's rules to sell their oil and bring stuff. Uh, but all in all, I would say I don't see any evidence that Iran is any more corrupt than Nigeria, for example, or Brazil, for that matter. So, yes, there is mismanagement and there is corruption uh, that is endemic in Iran. It's in many developing countries. Again, I don't know of many developing countries that run a clean ship. It's a matter of degree. And uh, the solution is not, in my view, more sanctions more austerity uh, until there is regime change, which may never happen, and increased suffering of the people. I think the solution is to uh, remove the barriers that force people to do clandestine operations, to force them to increase transparency and things like that. But all in all, I am not in a position to defend how the Iranian government behaves, and that's not really the point of this talk, it was to get uh, to you to know a little bit more uh, what's going on inside Iran. And if you already know how things are going, you probably don't want to listen to me. <laughs> I, I think mo most people are very appreciative of the, of the, uh, of the detail and the great uh, scholarship you've brought to us this afternoon. So we only have time for a couple of more questions. Thank you, Doctor, for your presentation. Uh, I have a question, especially when you provide the United Nations Human uh, HDI data, and uh, we can go to the site and compare Iran, Turkey, and Iran, even South Korea, since the revolution, Islamic Revolution in 1979. So my question about the recent phenomena in oil market and how it could affect the Iranian budget this year or maybe next year, uh, you told us that uh, Iran has decreasing its uh, dependence on oil it's in its budget. So how could you see that uh, this recent activity in oil market? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure I understood your question. Yes, Iran has reduced per force, not willingly, its dependence on oil because the world doesn't buy its oil and they, because the price is lower. That is the point. Uh, I'm not sure I got the last part of your question. How do I see this with this? So, so for example, now in budget, I think about $10 billion, uh, they, they assume to receive from oil uh, for crude oil, selling yeah. crude oil, but now it's diminishing, the, uh, the price is diminishing to one, uh, like yeah. zero. They are going to probably print more money. Uh, they are, the budget is a, is a blueprint. It's suggestive at this point with multiple crises hitting Iran, I don't see why the government, how the government can stay within the budget. The first casualty is going to be uh, the uh, public investment budget, which always is a place to put your hands in if you can't find money elsewhere. So that's going to go down to bare repair of roads and other infrastructure, no more new investment in this coming year, and uh, then borrowing borrowing and printing money. Those are things the governments do. Iran's inflation rate is probably going to run around 30% for a year or two, uh, which is terrible. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, Iran is paying a very heavy cost economically uh, for 
th things that it may be its fault and things that are not its fault. But that is the status of uh, Iran at the moment. So uh, I'm interested in the uh, in, in the degree of desperation and in, in the uh, in, in Iran in the in the in the uh, uh, working class and the precarious class of employees and and uh, uh, the, the the degree of, of welfare support that the government is providing to those people wh whether you have any knowledge of that and whether you could be willing to share with me and uh, when the government prints money is it is it selling treasury issues the, the way the United States does or 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 not thank you very much thank so, you for your question when you issue treasury bills you're not printing money you're borrowing Printing money is when no one lends you, and you uh, print uh, currency and uh, borrow by force from people. Uh, government will try to borrow. Uh, they are uh, issuing Islamic bonds. The question is whether people will buy them at a reasonable interest rate, or they will send the interest rate upward of 50%, at which time the government can't afford it and will borrow the banks and the bank banks borrow from the central bank, and that becomes new money, which will be chasing goods and create inflation. Iran is paying its people in a fairly efficient way. Everybody is getting some cash in their bank accounts every month. The amount is small. It probably it allows them to buy some bread and maybe even some chicken, but it's not enough to run a household. And that is the state of the world. Iranians are suffering because of the sanctions and because of the COVID. And to think that under the circumstances, they will disrupt the whole system to go and change a regime and bring about something, some regime that would be more desirable to the United States, I think is wishful thinking. And is a wishful thinking that is causing a lot of pain on ordinary Iranians. My question has to do with taxation, Javad. Corporate and individual taxation, yeah, yeah. and, and uh, the extent to which the government can actually raise revenue that way. Thank you. Government of Iran collect taxes mainly from salaried workers, those working in the formal sector. And there are serious limits to that. Iran lacks a good income reporting system where private businesses would declare their income so you could on the penalty of law, uh, have a good idea of how much money they made in the previous year. So I think taxes is not where the government is going to go. It really is going to be borrowing from whatever source it can. You know, it has asked China for money, it has asked Russia for money, it has IMF for money, and then it will print money. I think that's what's going to happen. All that is left for us to do right now is to thank uh, Professor Salahi Isfahani for giving us a talk that was a model of a deep knowledge, analytic clarity, and a saint-like patience. So uh, thank you, Javad, for, that, uh, for your intervention, and I look forward to many more. My pleasure. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Take care, everybody.